thank you, thank you for the, the introduction. Uh, and thank you for coming tonight. Uh, it's very good to see so many of you here. Uh, to, so in this, in this lecture, I would like to tell you something about uh, quant quantum fluids and the kind of physics you can, uh, you can uh, uh, study and investigate uh, based on, on, on these, these systems. And what, uh, what, what we're going to do is, is we're going to make a journey. Uh, we'll start with, uh, with a crash course on quantum physics because this is going to be really the, the foundations of, of, uh, of the discussion we're going to have today. And then we're going to, to, go, uh, to go cold. Uh, we're going to, uh, to go along this, this axis here and st study cold systems. And this is illustrated by this, um, th this, this photo, this picture here. This one is taken from a uh, um, couple of years back. Uh, it's uh, from my hometown in Finland. Uh, it's, uh, it was taken in January uh, around midday. And it's a, perhaps a little bit difficult to see, but uh, that's the sun there just managing to, to go above the horizon. And uh, this bit here is, is ice. It's, uh, you, I was standing on the sea. Um, the ice was this thick. Um, it was a good, a good winter's day, not too cold, minus 20 or so. Uh, but what we're going to do during this lecture uh, is, is going to be about things much, much colder. In fact, we're going to study systems which are uh, around nano-Kelvin temperatures, a billionth of a degree above the absolute zero. And this is going to be our quantum fluid. And we'll spend a few minutes um, discussing what, what they are and, uh, and, and uh, um, what kind of things you can do with them. But the, the, main, the main idea here, the main point I would like to make in, in this lecture is really the kind of physics that you can study using these quantum fluids and the kind of physics that you find in completely different areas of physics. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, something which is called synthetic material. Um, and uh, we're going to look at relativistic phenomena, relativistic physics, using quantum fluids, which are at nano-Kelvin temperatures, which may sound like a bizarre concept, but it's, uh, it's something that you, you do indeed come across. And we'll, we'll uh, end up discussing particle physics uh, and the phenomena that people encounter in, in, in high energy physics uh, also, um, again, using the quantum fluids as our, our, uh, our uh, uh, basis, our, our system in question. And after that, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll go big. We'll consider uh, large scale structures and, uh, and discuss um, um, gravity, in fact. And, uh, and, uh, and how you can uh, emulate or simulate uh, gravity, phenomena known from gravity, gravitational physics with quantum fluids. So that's what we, we have in, ahead of us, in front of us. So let's, uh, let's start with, with quantum physics. Uh, quantum physics is, is, the, is, the, is the best theory we have uh, for describing microscopic systems. Uh, it's certainly we, we certainly have to have to use quantum physics when we are when we want to understand how atoms work. Uh, uh, but in fact, uh, quantum phenomena, quantum physics, is also needed as long as soon as we have small systems. Uh, the atom is, of course, a small, tiny system. But also, uh, nano nanomechanical systems. Nowadays, we need to treat quantum mechanically. There, are, there, there are two two main aspects of quantum physics that, that we, we have to, to, to consider. One is uh, uh, the, the fact that particles at the quantum level, uh, need to, we need to describe them in terms of waves. Particles get wave properties. Uh, they're not small balls flying around in space anymore. We need to, to, to give them wave properties. So that's one thing. The other thing is the concept of quantization. Uh, physical, 
physical uh, properties of, of, uh, of, of our system uh, have uh, discrete values only. Now, the, the, a good example is, is the atom. The atom has discrete energy levels. If we excite an atom then, uh, it, and it emits later on light, then that light will only come in discrete frequencies. Uh, that's because of quantum physics. The, we need a language to describe quantum physics also, and that language is, is mathematics. In, uh, just illustrated by this symbol there. In, in this lecture, we're not going to use any mathematics. Uh, there's one equation towards the end. Uh, instead, uh, we'll only use pictures and some furious hand-waving by me. Uh, but hopefully you'll get the main, the main idea, um, uh, also without, without the maths. So that's, that's, that's quantum physics. Um, it's everything we need to know, in fact, about quantum physics for, this, for, this, for the moment. Now, what about quantum fluids, then? Because this is our, our, our main interest. Uh, the recipe to... to, to to how to make a quantum fluid is actually quite, um, quite simple. Uh, we, need to, we need to trap atoms. Uh, we need to confine them. Uh, these atoms will be charge neutral, uh, so they have no charge. Uh, this will become important later on. So we need to trap these atoms, and we need to cool them down to extremely low temperatures. Now, you can trap atoms by, by for instance, optical means. If you shine a laser on an atom and you focus the laser and if you choose the frequency cleverly, the atom may, will, feel, uh, will be attracted to the high intensity part of the laser beam. Uh, you can also use magnetic fields uh, in the spirit of a magnetic bottle. Um, the conclusion is that now, nowadays in, in, in labs, um, uh, the experimentalists trap atoms uh, routinely. This is not a problem anymore. You also need to cool the, the atoms down or the gas down. This you can do, for instance, by using lasers again, to use what's called laser cooling. Now, we're not going to spend any time on, 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 the, on the details of how you can cool the gas, but it, uh, it relies on the, the interplay between the, the, the forces exerted on by the light on the atoms and the uh, decay properties of the, of the atom. And the interplay between these two, these, these two um, phenomena can, uh, can indeed slow down uh, atoms uh, in a laser beam. And the slower an atom is, the, the colder it is also. Now, in, in nature, there are, there are two types of, of uh, particles. Uh, they're called bosons and fermions. And they're very different um, um, uh, particles. Fermions are uh, uh, fermions don't like to to uh, to to be together. Basically, you can't put two fermions in the same physical state. You can't put two fermions in the same space. Uh, quantum physics doesn't allow that. Um, bosons, on the other hand, are different. With a boson, with a bosonic particle, you can put two bosons in the same quantum state. Uh, and, uh, and this is, in fact, the, the, the particle that we are going to consider, bosonic atomic gases. OK, so what happens then if we take these, these, these types of, of particles and we cool, we're able to cool them down? Uh, what happens then? Take, for instance, the, the, this room here and the, the air in, inside this room. Um, the, the molecules um, at room temperature here, as far as, as, as physics goes, they're just classical tiny balls flying around, bumping into each other. And there's no quantum physics involved, you could argue. Uh, it's completely classical, classical uh, uh, picture. When we lower the temperature of, uh, say, a gas, a gas of atoms. What's going to happen is that the lower the temperature is, the slower the atoms are. Uh, the slower they are, the more quantum they will become, which means that they get 
these wave properties. More and, they become more and more like waves. And the atom has to be described like a small wave packet rather than a, a ball. And the lower we go in temperature, the bigger the wave packets become, uh, which means that the velocity and the, the, the position gets a bit fuzzy. We can't describe them exactly anymore. And eventually, when we go really low in temperature, uh, these wave packets will start to overlap, and the, the, these, the atoms will start to, what is said, condense into a lowest state, physical state of the, of the, the gas. And this, would, this is called the ground state of, uh, of the confined um, uh, gas. What it, what it means for, when you're doing an experiment is, is the following. So this picture here, uh, these three snapshots, uh, they're taking, th this is uh, Aidan Arnold's uh, uh, experiment done a couple of years ago in Glasgow. Uh, and what, uh, what you're looking at is uh, the density of a gas, an atomic gas, um, about say 100,000 or half a million atoms. And what, what is done there, it, you, they've taken a picture of the gas and the, the, the greener or more purple, bluish it is, the higher the density is. And this is at some temperature, quite a high temperature. Uh, but when we lower the temperature, there's a critical temperature below which this, uh, this uh, gas of, at of, of, of atoms start to populate that, that lowest state, physical state. And uh, you can think of, uh, some of you had, had coffee, had, had, had coffee just outside before we started. Uh, the, when the coffee is hot, the, the molecules fly around, bump into, 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 into the wall, walls. Uh, and when, we, when, the, when the coffee is cooling down, the molecules will fall down to the bottom of the coffee cup. And this is what you see here. This, is, this part is what's at the very bottom of the coffee cup. If we go even lower in temperature, all the atoms will be at the bottom. And that's, uh, that's our, our quantum fluid. Uh, that's, the, that's the thing we want to work with. Uh, and this is also called, uh, um, that particular state is also called a Bose-Einstein condensate. So the question then, then is, um, uh, what, can we, what can we do with, uh, with uh, such, um, such um, uh, a fluid? Uh, and it is indeed a fluid. So we're, we're going to look at, uh, at two properties of it, uh, and then move on to, to the links and connections to other fields of physics. So before we get there, Let's, uh, let's look at this, this, um, this example here. Uh, so this experiment was done, it's almost 20 years ago now. It's, it, it was, the, the picture is taken from, uh, from MIT, Wolfgang Ketterle's group. And what they've done here is, is the following. They took, they took this, this, uh, this um, Bose-Einstein condensate, or the, the, the quantum fluid. Um, they, they separated it into two, into two bits like that. And then they smashed them together. Well, I say smashed, but, but, but they very, very, close, very carefully put them together, in fact. <laughs> well, let's not bog down into details here. OK, so they, they come together like that. And uh, when, they, when they hit each other, they see this. This is a picture of the cloud, uh, um, a shadow of the cloud, in fact. And you see something remarkable here. You see that, that uh, first of all, black is lots of, lots of atoms, lots of density. density. White is no, uh, no uh, atoms. So there are regions in space where uh, the atoms aren't. That there are no atoms. So what we are looking at is, is interference from, uh, from uh, 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 these, these atoms. But, but it's important to realize what it really means is that uh, imagine taking two rocks, one there and one there, really massive things, big things. You put them together like that, 
And all of a sudden, you see regions in space where the rock is no more. That would be the white sections there. This is really what's happening here, because what we're working with is massive particles. They're atoms. It's not light. These are, these are, uh, these are matter waves, really, what, what, what we're interfering. And this clearly shows that what we're working with is, uh, is, uh, is a quantum object. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a very big quantum object. If you look at the, if you look at, uh, at this uh, number here, it says uh, 0 0.12 millimeters, so 100 or so mic micrometers. This, uh, this is uh, a huge number, uh, relatively speaking. For a quantum, for a quantum object, it's, uh, it's a big thing. These clouds can be up to a millimeter long, and they are all coherent. Coherent meaning that, uh, that uh, if we do this type of interfer collision uh, 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 thing, we see interference. So what, we're have, what we have in front of us is, uh, is a big quantum object. That's interesting in itself, in fact. So that's interference. That's the wave properties. What about the, the, quant the quantumness, the, the discreteness of... Um, of um, of these systems. And for that, you can look at, uh, at uh, the, the following thing. Um, so we have four, four examples here, four clouds, four experiments done. Uh, and again, the, the, what you're looking at is the density of the cloud. And this picture, again, is from, from MIT, same group, uh, uh, on, as we had on the previous slide. What they've done here is um, they've taken the cloud and they have tried to stir it, to rotate it. And, uh, and, and let's go back to, back to the, the coffee cup uh, analogy again. So if you had coffee just before we started, you, maybe you had a spoon and you stirred, stirred it a little bit. Uh, that's what they did. And this is what you get. <laughs> Now, th that coffee that you were stirring uh, with the spoon started to go around and in, a, in a very continuous manner. Um, so nothing, nothing surprising there. But if you try to do the same thing with this, uh, this, this thing here, then this cloud of atoms, so this, this, uh, this, uh, um, uh, this gas or fluid, uh, is not able to rotate continuously. It can only rotate in a, in, in a discrete uh, fashion. If you look at the angular momentum of, of that system, then the angular momentum is quantized. Um, so that's clearly a quantum effect. I mean, you do what, what, what they've actually done in that experiment is they took, they trapped the cloud, they took a laser. We're going to use a laser now. That's the laser there. So that's the cloud is there. They shine the laser literally, literally the way I do it here now, and they do that. So that's the spoon, the coffee, coffee cup, and the spoon thing. And when you do that, you, you kind of you swirl things around, so, and you effectively go, you, you rotate the system. And if you do it fast enough, the, that, that fluid uh, picks up a vortex. It's a quantized vortex. And, around, and that's what, you, what you're looking at here. That's the, the, uh, the holes there. These are vortex lines. And around these vortices, uh, the, the fluid flows in, in a quantized manner, with a quantized angular momentum. So this, this also clearly shows that what we have is indeed a fluid, and it's what is called a superfluid, uh, but it's now in, in the gas, gas uh, phase. But still, it has the properties of a fluid. OK. so. So this, this, show, this showed that, that what, we, what we have is indeed a, a, a quantum fluid. Now, the question is, what, what can we do with it? And um, uh, the, first, the first thing that we'll discuss is um, uh, what's called uh, synthetic matter. And for this, we need, uh, we need uh, so just to, to remind you where we are, 
we just we just discussed the, the, the quantum fluid. We're now going along this line, and we'll look at uh, still small things, um, but uh, something which we call synthetic uh, materials. And if we want to do that, what we need is uh, is an egg carton. And what we're going to do is we're going to pour uh, pour our fluid into this carton. And uh, we'll see how, how the fluid um, can go from one side to the other, for instance. Uh, and uh, we'll see how much is stuck in these uh, valleys here. And uh, uh, think about what that means. What, what you're looking at here is, is nothing but uh, a crystal, kind of a crystal. And uh, it's, uh, it's also what, what the way we understand, uh, on the way, the way things indeed are, uh, for instance, with, with metals. So we're, if we're interested in metals and the transport properties of a metal, meaning how, how the electrons and, and charges uh, move, move in, in, uh, in wires, for instance, then we need to, to understand how, how uh, particles hop in a, in a structure such as this one. Okay, so we you probably realize that we can't really use an egg carton, but it's a nice picture. We need to use a slightly more advanced egg carton. It's, uh, it's this one. Uh, th this picture is from the Max Planck Institute in Garching near Munich, where, uh, where they make these, uh, these, these egg cartons. Uh, but they're made with, with light. Um, it's, they're, called, they're called optical lattices. And an optical lattice is, is, you can make an optical lattice using standing waves. Uh, and the, the idea is as follows. You, uh, you take, in this example, four lasers, counter-propagating. And if you do that, uh, you get a modulated intensity in, in both directions. And that modulated intensity, also, also illustrated here, will act as a, as, a, as a potential, as a confining uh, uh, potential to the atoms. So we can load this, this uh, or we, we, can, we can put the, the fluid into this uh, structure. And if we are careful, the, uh, the atoms will be stuck in, uh, in these um, uh, valleys. If we are really careful, we can even make sure that we have, on average, only one atom per well. Um, now, this is interesting because um, what, what, what we then are looking at is, uh, is a model of, uh, of, for instance, a metal. Uh, we don't have to stick to this simple geometry of the, the lattice, the square like geometry. We can use different geometries, hexagonal geometries. We can have a super lattices so that we have several periods uh, in there, superposed, and so on. And by doing that, we can, we can simulate or emulate different synthetic materials. Because that's what materials are. It's all about. It's just crystals or lattices uh, in different forms and shapes. And we're interested in how, how how particles hop from one side to the other. OK, so uh, that's one thing. The other thing is, if we can, if we can make something like this, uh, what, uh, what we also have is, is, so these atoms here, they can hop from one place to the other. That's, that's, uh, that's a quantum effect, effect in, in fact. But they also collide with each other. So when, uh, when one atom wants to go from there to there, and uh, the, this place already has an atom in it, then it's going to cost energy to, to do that. So there's a balance between hopping and uh, having, uh, having too, too many atoms in one place. Now, these, these atoms can, uh, can uh, interact very strongly. Um, they can collide very strongly. And if we have such a situation, then uh, we, we run, into, run into a problem. Because what we can do, we can write down the, the mathematical model for, uh, for this system. 
And this mathematical model uh, takes into account the collisions and interactions between the atoms. Uh, this mathematical model uh, predicts, predicts extremely well what uh, this experiment will do. This is, this is the nice thing with, uh, with, uh, with quantum optics and, and condensed matter physics uh, with the cold atoms is that the, 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 the models that we have and the experiments uh, really go hand in hand. So what, say if our model predicts something, then we can be very sure that that's also going to happen in, in the experiment. Okay, so the point I want to make is that when we take these, when we have this model then, a mathematical model, and if we try to, un we try to, to answer the question, well, what is the lowest physical state or energy state for this system? That can turn out to be impossible to calculate, in fact, provided that, that uh, this, uh, the interactions are very strong. Now, this is really annoying as a theorist. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's, it's impossible to calculate from a really practical point of view, because if it's a quantum state, and we have lots of atoms, many atoms, and many means here 10 or 20, then, then the number of states that we need to be able to, to store in a computer is simply too big. Uh, we can run a, a computer like this or even a supercomputer for the whole, the entire life of the universe and we would still not arrive at the answer. But, we can in fact use the experiment as our, uh, as our uh, uh, solver, computer. And what, because what the experiment is doing, we can just ask the experiment to, uh, to relax to the lowest state or look at some dynamics. And we just measure what the experiment is doing. So the experiment is actually doing a simulation for us, a simulation that we cannot do on a classical computer because it just takes too long. And that's an example of a special purpose quantum computer. Uh, it's also called a, a quantum simulation. It's one of the, the, the hot topics at the moment um, regarding quantum technologies and these things. So this is nice. This is what you can do with, uh, with uh, optical lattices in particular. Okay, so Let's, let's go one, one, one step further um, to something which is called synthetic magnetism. Now these, um, the, these atoms uh, in, in the fluid, they are, they are charge neutral. They don't have any charge. What that means is that if we put a magnetic field on them, these atoms are not going to behave as, uh, as, a, as an electron, as a charged particle. What that means is that if we... Um, we look at this picture here. So, so this is um, uh, standard electrons uh, being uh, ejected out from, from there. And there's a magnetic field um, acting on them. And the motion that we will see is, is, uh, is circular like this. This is called the Lorentz force acting on them. And uh, that's the, the dynamics that you see when a charged particle is moving in a, in a magnetic field. Uh, the reason why we see uh, this purple ring here, uh, electrons aren't purple, by the way. <laughs> uh, the, the, the electrons are colliding with the a, with a, with a background gas, with the molecules, and it's the molecules that are being excited and sends out that purple light. So that's, that's how, how a charged particle would, would behave in a, in, a, in a magnetic field. But the, so the question is, how can we make these, uh, these fluids behave as if they had, a, had a, a charge and as if they were subject to a magnetic field? This, this is interesting or this is important because with our quantum simulator hat on, if we can add a magnetic field to that picture, then we can uh, solve uh, many more different types of problems, uh, exotic, exotic type of, of situations, often related to topological properties of, of, uh, of materials, which is another hot topic at the moment. Um, 
but we won't, we won't talk about topology in, in this lecture. So how, how can you make an atom uh, behave, behave as if, a neutral atom behave as if it had a charge? Well, you can, uh, you can do the following. So this is our, our atom. Uh, if you haven't seen an atom before, this is what they look like. They're, they're yellow um, and with two levels like that. Uh, that's, that's what an atom looks like for a theorist. Uh, and two, two internal levels, two energy levels, as, as we say. And uh, we shine uh, a laser on, the, on these atoms. Uh, so that's the laser there, uh, indicating that those two levels are coupled. Uh, uh, the atom interacts with the, with the light. If we choose again our, our frequency cleverly, then uh, the, the, uh, that coupling between, uh, between uh, the laser light and the, and the atom uh, will, uh, will, will slightly polarize and stretch the atom. And the light will induce a force on the atom, therefore. And if we then, in addition, allow the atom or atoms to, or a fluid, in fact, move around in space, then the resulting mathematical description, the equations that govern the motion of this, this fluid then, picks up uh, uh, something which is called a gauge potential. It's, uh, it's a mathematical uh, thing uh, that, uh, in fact, shows up when we describe the motion of real charged particles. But this, this, uh, this bit here, the, what we call the gauge potential, is another way to define magnetic fields also. So by shining light on the atom, uh, uh, we, we can indeed have a situation where, where uh, the synthetic magnetic field that then appears makes the atom uh, move about in space as if it had a charge. Now, so this, this gauge potential here um, is, uh, is in fact key to the, to the next, uh, next topic, uh, which is relativistic physics. Uh, the, the, in, this, in this example that I'm going to, to discuss, uh, we use uh, a slightly more, uh, more complicated atom. Uh, this one's elliptic. I know it's a bad joke. <laughs> uh, we just we just have more uh, more uh, uh, internal levels to to uh, to address with the laser, and and what what is done here is uh, is the following. Uh, this this purple thing here is our fluid. We uh, we shine we shine light on it with three different lasers. These three different these three lasers are going to to dress the, 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 uh, the atom. It's going to, to, to do that, that stretching and polarizing uh, thing again with the atom. Now again, we allow the atom to move around in space. That, the, the, the mathematical description of that motion, the way we describe the motion, turns out to be exactly of the same form as you would have with a relativistic particle, relativistic electron in this case, uh, uh, would have. So mathematically speaking, the two, the two situations are, are, are the same. A relativistic electron and a uh, um, nano-Kelvin temperature superfluid or, or, or quantum fluid obey the same, same mathematical equations. This, this, this equation is called the Dirac equation for those of you who, who, who are familiar with, with these concepts. But there's a big difference. For a standard, uh, for a standard uh, relativistic particle, um, we have the speed of light. Speed of light is the, sets the, the scale of, of, of everything. Um, the speed of light is, what is it, 300,000 kilometers per second, so it's pretty fast. The, the, the quantum fluid, which obeys the same equations, also has a, has a, has a, has a velocity associated to the speed. That speed is of the order of millimeters per second. So a huge difference. 
uh, what that means in practice is that we can, by, uh, by looking at, uh, at um, the very cold quantum fluid, we can study phenomena that uh, people have thought about in real relativistic scenarios. And we can also study phenomena that you cannot, maybe cannot measure in, in real um, relativistic situations because the length scales and time scales are so much different. And this is, uh, so what you're looking at here is one example of that. Uh, the, that uh, thing moving about there is the density of the, of the fluid uh, in along, uh, along this direction here. And uh, uh, we, it's a free uh, fluid, meaning that there's no confinement uh, it's, uh, acting on, on that fluid. We just put the fluid there and see what happens. Um, no forces acting on it. And what we see is that it's not, uh, it's not uh, staying still. Um, it, it just does a little bit of that. And this is, this is a relativistic effect. In fact, it's called a uh, Zitterbewegung. Uh, uh, and uh, was, in fact, predicted um, really in the early days of, of uh, quantum physics. Uh, Schrodinger thought about these things when, when uh, people were discussing how to, how to treat relativistic phenomena in, with, with quantum physics. Uh, this is something that you wouldn't be able to measure for a real uh, electron because, of, uh, because the, the effect is simply too small. But for, uh, for, the, the, uh, for this uh, uh, very cold system, you, you would indeed see it. And now it has been uh, done in, in experiments also with, with, cold, with cold atoms. Uh, and also uh, trapped ions, in fact. OK, so, so what, what do we have then? We have, uh, we have uh, we've seen that with, in, our, in our quantum fluid, we can emulate uh, what we call gauge potentials and synthetic magnetic fields. And uh, we can have a situation which is uh, uh, relativistic, or quasi, let's call it quasi-relativistic. This is certainly not a relativistic system. It's at nano-Kelvin temperatures, but it just behaves as if it was relativistic. So we have relativity and we have uh, uh, gauge potentials. Then that, that, that takes us to, 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 to this, this challenge here. Um, so what, what we're looking at here is uh, uh, the... Uh, it's a phase diagram. Phase diagram means that uh, we're looking at states of matter uh, as, uh, which depend on, on, in this case, two parameters, the density and the temperature or, or energy. So what, we, what, what, is, what is sketched there is what's called the, the, uh, the quantum chromodynamics phase diagram. It's the way we understand how matter really behaves and how it's, it's put together. So this is what, what the Large Hadron Collider and, and at CERN and other big accelerators are, are trying to, to map out and probe. So I'll, I'll briefly, briefly say a few words about what, what, what it is we're looking at here. So density on this axis energy on this axis. Uh, we, we are here. This is, this is our world down here. What that means is that this green region is, is, is um, particles as we know them. Stable atoms, protons, neutrons, uh, stable things. Um, our particles are confined um, and everything is so nice. If we if we go up in energy, and this is where uh, uh, what, what the big accelerators are doing, you go into, into a, a regime which uh, is called the quark-gluon plasma, where, uh, where uh, the, the, this is no longer the case that, that particles are, are um, that we are in this confined regime anymore. Because we smash things together and everything falls apart. Uh, so the, the big question then is, well, what happens between, how, how, do you, how do you go from one to the other? 
How do you describe that? Where is it in, in terms of, uh, of energy and so on? Um, so the, what, what, we, what you have here is a, some kind of a soup of particles. Um, big question is, where is the transition? This is a really difficult problem. In fact, it's so difficult that you run into this quantum simulator uh, idea again. Because the model that, that in principle maps out this is the standard model uh, called, uh, is, is so complicated uh, that uh, uh, we can't solve it exactly. We have to make approximations, which is fine, as long as you know what you're doing and you make sure that you are in the right regime. You, you should indeed do approximations. But if you want to solve things exactly, then, then we're in trouble. And for that, we would need a quantum computer. But now, now uh, what we have, what we just saw, we, we, have, we, we have access to, to gauge potentials, which in fact describe the fundamental forces. This is how we describe fundamental forces between particles. Uh, in, this is in terms of gauge, gauge fields. We, we, can, uh, we can create those with our fluid, and we can have a, a, a quasi-relativistic system also. So the hope then is, and, and this is still work in progress, uh, is to be able to, to probe the, the kind of phenomena that you have in, in, uh, in, uh, in high energy physics, uh, also with these, um, with these very cold quantum fluids. And you see all kinds of crazy things here. If you, if you uh, go along this line, you increase the density more and more, you reach somewhere around here, it's believed that you, uh, you end up with a state which corresponds to what you have in neutron stars. So extremely dense, dense uh, states of matter. If you go even further, it's believed that, that you should see uh, very exotic uh, pairing mechanisms between, between particles. Uh, pairing mechanisms which gives rise to what's called superconductivity. Uh, a multi-component superconductivity, in fact. All these things we, we would like to, to be able to address also in the low temperature uh, uh, case. Okay, so, so where, where are we? we we've, we've discussed uh, uh, the, the very cold and the very hot and what we will do next in, uh, in, in, in uh, two or three minutes uh, we're going to discuss uh, the, the large-scale structure um, uh, up here and see what the connections are between, uh, between uh, the large-scale structure and uh, the universe and the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the quantum fluid. And, uh, and, and to illustrate this, uh, we're going to discuss gravity and quantum matter. Uh, Einstein's theory of, of relativity uh, uh, tells us how we should understand gravity. Massive objects uh, uh, distort space-time. Um, a massive object can, for instance, deflect light uh, and so on. So we need to work with curved space-time uh, when we talk about uh, gravity. This is how, how, how we nowadays understand uh, these forces, gravitational forces. But, uh, but uh, the, the general theory of relativity is a classical theory. Uh, there's no quantum in, the, in it. Uh, and uh, um, so that's, that's one thing. Um, if we look then at quantum physics, uh, we see that, well, there's no, there's, no, there's no gravity in quantum physics either. And what we would like to do is we would like to combine these two, these two uh, pictures. And this is the quantum gravity problem, uh, and one of the really big unsolved uh, questions in physics. How, how to do that? How to come up with a theory that can, can uh, deal with both, uh, both uh, pictures, situations? The micros microscopic and the macroscopic, the same footing. And one, one thing you can do then is to, to look at the extremes in, uh, in, um, in, in uh, in uh, gravity settings. Uh, and one, uh, one good example is the black hole. A black hole is a, is a super dense, massive uh, object. In fact, it's so dense that uh, 
that uh, everything is sucked into it and uh, you, you cannot simply escape from a black hole. There's, um, it also means that if you, if you shine, shine light onto a black hole, the light is also sucked in uh, and can't escape. That's why it's called black. Uh, so what, what, uh, what, you, what you then have uh, near a black hole is, uh, is uh, there's, a, there's a region in space uh, beyond which, if you go beyond it, you're, you're just inevitably sucked into the black hole. There's no, no, no escape. And that region is called the horizon uh, or event horizon. Uh, and uh, um, what, uh, what I'll show you is, uh, is uh, how you can uh, emulate this, this type of a situation uh, with, uh, with quantum fluids. So what we are actually going to do is something like this. Uh, this is um, uh, this cartoon here is uh, uh, there's nothing quantum about this one. There, there's no no such thing as a quantum fish. Uh, what 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 we have here is a river. Uh, river flows from right to left, and uh, there's a, there's a cliff edge here, and uh, uh, where the water eventually ends up. The, the the flow, the velocity of the of the flow speed of the of the river is such that it's it's very low here, and then it goes faster and faster and faster, and here it's really really very fast. The fish uh, in this river can, can uh, swim at a, at a set speed at the, the fish velocity, fish speed, that's Vf there. You see, that's the equation I was talking about. <laughs> that's, as, that's, that's as complicated as it got. Uh, so the, 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 the fish can swim with, with, a, with, a, with some velocity. The river flows with some velocity increasing downstream more and more. So, and there, so there's a point in, in this river where, where the fish velocity and the river velocity is the same. That's going to be our horizon, in fact. So if you, if you look at uh, these fish then, um, these two here, they look quite happy, but they have no reason to smile because they are going to be swept downstream into the abyss down here. There's no way they can escape because they can't swim fast enough. The river flows too fast for them in this region. Where are we? In this region. Now these, these three fish uh, are going to make it because in this region the, the, the river doesn't flow uh, fast enough for them to be swept backwards. They can in fact escape uh, and, and uh, look happy. So what we're going to do is we're going to, or what, what one can do then, is to, uh, to, uh, to make a, a quantum fluid version of this. Uh, I should say that you don't have to use quantum fluids for this type of experiment. You can also use light. And this is, in fact, something that's being done here at Harriet Watt also. But, but you, can, you, can, uh, you can use a, a quantum fluid. And... Uh, Remember, we were talking earlier on about the, the flow of, um, of, of the quantum fluid around the vortices. Well, here we, we, we can do something, in fact, much, much simpler. We can just um, make the fluid flow through some, some kind of waveguide uh, and uh, such that uh, the, the, um, that background flow increases. OK, so what about the fish then? Well, the, 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 the fish in our quantum fluid is, is going to be waves. So if you have a fluid and you, you tap it, then waves are going to start traveling out. These waves will travel with the speed of sound, the sound waves. Uh, that's, that's a set speed. Uh, depends on, the, on the, uh, the details of the fluid. Uh, but it's a speed. Uh, it's a speed limit, you could say. Uh, and these waves then, uh, depending on, on, uh, on where, on which side of that, of that uh, artificial horizon, um, uh, these waves are going to propagate uh, or forward or being swept backwards. Now, so why is this interesting? It's interesting because what we have then is uh, we have an, an artificial horizon. We have 
you could say, you could argue that we have an artificial black hole. Uh, and um, in standard gravity, this is a classical theory. Black holes are there, yes, um, but there's no quantum, quantum theory behind it. Now we have an analog black hole, uh, uh, but in addition we have a quantum fluid. And in addition we have a, a, a quantum theory to describe the quantum fluid. So the, the, what we can do then is to, to analyze this system, uh, this gravita gravitational analog system, and look at the quantum effects near black holes and try to understand what it means, to, what it means for, for uh, creating these, these, uh, these waves near, uh, near, uh, near the, the horizon. So this is uh, that's an example of uh, what you can do uh, um, uh, with, with gravity in, in quantum fluids. So we, we, we've, reached, we've reached the end of the, of the lecture now, and uh, uh, we've looked at, at, uh, at uh, the, um, the connections between, between uh, cold quantum fluids and, and uh, uh, different uh, physical, uh, physical phenomena in, in, uh, in, in, in very different uh, situations. And personally, the, the reason why I, I like this, this line of, of, of work uh, is because it, it really forces you to, to learn new things. It's not only as, as, a, as a student, undergraduate or, or PhD student, that you, you learn new things. You, 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 learn, you have to learn new things as a professor also. And this is really nice. The, the, the other thing is, is that uh, I'm, I'm convinced that uh, if, if we are to make a significant contribution to our understanding of nature, then we have to take the broad picture. Uh, we cannot or we should not uh, uh, focus too narrowly. What it, what it means is that, well, you, you have to know everything. And that's, that's of course, impossible, but, um, but you, you have to try at least. And with, with, with those words, I'll, I'll finish here, and I thank you for, for listening.